The Security Weekly News is live on Tuesdays and Fridays at 12 o'clock Eastern Time, most every week. I try to scan and produce a quick look at some major stories to help you keep up with what's going on in and around the industry in a short format. Myself, Jason Wood, and other guest commentators provide greater insight every week. I'm Doug White, and I hope that you will look for the Security Weekly News in all of your favorite podcast catchers and subscribe for the latest content. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. I have here with me Mr. Jeff Mann. Jeff, welcome. Always happy to be here, Paul. Mr. Tyler Robinson is also here with us. Tyler, welcome. Nice to be here. I'm glad you're feeling better. Yes, I am on on the mend. Hopefully, this is the end of. We won't talk about it now. But in any case, and what's uh, that? What's that cool new hat you're wearing? That's right. This is my new my little uh, hackers movie swag. Hack the planet. I got like a signed floppy disk and stuff like that. I put it on Facebook. Very very excited. Could be a, a, like a telling of uh, things to come, Jeff. So we'll see. I feel like I need to go get some sneakers memorabilia now there you to, go. to keep to keep up with you. Try and get that sneaker soundtrack to. Oh wait, never mind. This segment is. <laughs> Sponsored by ThreatLocker, you can visit securityweekly.com forward slash ThreatLocker to learn more. Of course, if you want to learn more about me and find uh, references to like stuff like my bio, podcast I host, securitypodcaster.com is my website. With us today, I'm excited to uh, have with us Mr. Danny Jenkins, the CEO and co-founder of ThreatLocker, a cybersecurity firm providing zero trust endpoint security. Uh, and it says a lot of other things, but I'm going to give it my own endorsement. Danny and I met uh, years ago now, and Danny explained to me what he was doing at ThreatLocker. I'm like, guys, great. If you can make it work, you're going to be really successful. Danny comes back years later. I'm like, dude, how you doing? wildly successful right danny you're on a series c you've got 300 employees and you're crushing it man you're crushing it yeah i think about 320 employees we're, we're about forty six thousand businesses protected now and uh, we've completed with series c funding was the latest which is about 18 months ago so really right. doing great but uh, you know what i'm likely to see is more and more companies adopting this idea of zero trust and allow listing and ring fencing and actually taking serious steps towards security rather than just saying, I'll buy something else and hope it works. And I just, and congratulations, Danny, because it's not, you know, obviously not very often that someone is like down that path successful, right? The, the uh, most companies are not going to be down that path, right? You think you said in your accelerator, you were the only one that's still around from like your original uh, accelerator. So absolutely. So we're the only company still around because startups aren't easy. And yeah. when we started the company, we were challenging the norm. I and mean, we were saying, we're going to do something that everyone says is a dumb idea, which is block everything and only allow what you need. And when we did that, it was, it was hard at first. People said, this isn't going to work. This is going to mm. be too hard. This is going to be difficult to manage. And I think when we get those first customers, it was difficult to get those companies to trust that this is not going to be hard. And then once we did that, it, they, they talked about us and it snowballed. More and more companies said, oh, you're using that. That works. That's great. Let me get, have a look at it. Was it really that they thought it would be too hard or, or, or to what degree did they also think it was going to be an inconvenience because you were going to block the legitimate stuff and just slow things down? Well, and I think that was the thing. They were, they were worried that it was going to be inconvenient to their users. Their users were going to get mad. Their business was going to get mad. It was going to stop productivity. So that was step one. And they're worried about updates and all, all programs like that. And this is going to be a nightmare to manage. And that, that was the real challenge for them that, and it's still it's still a perception today, even though we got forty six thousand companies using Threat Locker, and a lot of those are very small companies, and a lot of them are very big companies. Companies like U.S. Navy, JetBlue are also using Threat Locker. But what they realize is the inconvenience to the user is worse when you're relying on just detection tools, because the difference between looking for something bad in the old days, you look for something bad, and the probability of something good getting flagged as bad was pretty low. Mm -hmm. Now, because it's getting so hard to detect bad things. The EDRs, the antiviruses are getting closer and closer. They're trying to get as close to that line as possible. And quite often they step over it. And when they step mm. over the line, things get blocked. They shouldn't do because suddenly this good piece of software is using the same encryption algorithm built into it as a piece of ransomware. And now the good software is being flagged as bad. What's nice about the way we're doing it is we're saying, hey, it's good. We've learned it. It's in your environment. And we frankly don't care what anything else says because it's in your environment and let's allow it to run a limit of what it can do. So the amount of noise to the user actually goes down when you start implementing a least privilege approach. 
So when you're, when you're talking about kind of that zero, zero trust model, what kind of tier or pillars do you guys typically find yourself fitting within, uh, as far as that, that the whole zero trust strategy and, and roadmap goes? So, and this is the misconception about zero trust. So if you, if you read the zero trust framework or the zero trust concept, the, the, the initial concept is don't give more privilege than is required. So only grant access to a service node or user that is required to perform the function or job that they require. It's not about network. It's not necessarily about files, but it's, 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 it's the whole area. So technically going into your file share and saying, I'm going to remove access from everyone and only grant access where I need, that's an element of zero trust. But what we're thinking about is the end point. We're thinking about malware. We're thinking about what is running in your environment because the same principle allows what software can run. By default, you install Windows, you install an antivirus, you install an EDR. Every single piece of software in the world can run on that machine unless it's known bad. When you operate zero trust, what you do is you say, I'm going to learn what I need and only that can run in my environment. And the great thing about that is it stops users downloading games. It stops potential vulnerable software being introduced to your business environment that you didn't know about. But it also stops unknown malware because malware is just software. So when you say, I'm going to not trust any software unless it's needed in my business, you say ransomware can't run, advanced IP scanner can't run. When you get a scam call from someone pretending to work for Microsoft and they send you a team viewer link, that won't be able to run because it's not on the list of trusted software. And that's where we're focusing. We're focusing on not the, although we do have that like a network control on the endpoints, but we're not focused about firewall network, ZTNA stuff. That's really focused on other companies are focused on that. What we're focused on is the endpoint and what needs to happen on that endpoint, what applications need to run, what those applications need to do. Does PowerShell need to see your files? And does Office need to talk to PowerShell? Limit what they can do. And that is really, really effective at stopping malicious attacks at the endpoint. Yeah, Danny, how did you how did you develop the kind of database and baseline to differentiate good from bad? So and I don't think there is a differentiation sometimes between good and bad. I think the differentiation is between needed and not needed. Because and what we do is first thing we do is when you deploy throughout Locker, it learns what you need or what you're using, not what you need. And then it tells you this is what you're using. Now we match that to known applications. Mm -hmm. And quite often people confuse that with good applications, not necessarily good. So we will say, hey, we found Microsoft Office on your computer. Mm -hmm. We've created a policy to allow Office, and that policy links to ThreatLocker's database. So every future DLL, every future executable in Threat that's Office release is going to be allowed. And we have a team of 120 people in our labs department that do nothing but monitor that, that stuff. Mm -hmm. We found Chrome, but we can also find TeamViewer and uh, log me and rescue. And these aren't good or bad. Mm -hmm. The question becomes is, are they needed or not needed? Now we'll say, hey, this is TeamViewer. We validated this is TeamViewer. We're not here to tell you you should use TeamViewer. We're here to say, if you want it, leave it on. If you don't, turn it off. And, but, and that's, the of, that's, that's the whitelisting part of it, right? Like just it, it's off or it's on, right? And that's, yeah. that's traditional whitelisting. Like this application should be here or not, should it, like do these things or have access to these files or not, right? That's traditional whitelisting, which traditionally has been very difficult to manage. And I think that's the, some people's hesitation. I'm sure you run into this still today, that hesitation of whitelisting sounds really hard, Danny. So, and I think, yes, yeah, so traditional whitelisting is can this file, can this executable DLL script um, run and normally based on a hash, not based on a hmm. file name, because yep. that would be bad. Right. Um, can this file run or can't it run? Traditional whitelisting isn't dealing with, well, what can it do once it's running? So what, what we've done is said, okay, well, traditional whitelisting, the, the concept's great, but the, what about the challenges? And the challenges really are three things. One is figuring out what to run. The average computer has 20, 30,000 DLLs on it, um, executable DLL script files. Uh, second is how do I tr deal with the updates for that? Windows updates, Office updates, Chrome updates, Zoom mm -hmm. updates, WebEx web updates, and two and a half thousand other apps are updating. And the third is how do I deal with exceptions? When a user does need to add new software, how difficult is that? So we learn really, really fast, really, really easily. And the nice thing about the way we learn, we learn by hash, but we also cross-reference, hey, this program needs to be allowed by certificate because it constantly changes hash. 
we track updates for two and a half thousand apps. So as a user, most people, they deploy throughout Locker, it learns the software they've got and they never have to worry about an update being blocked. Mm -hmm. And then we make the approval process easy. That's the whitelisting. And the whitelisting, we've kind of nailed it in that it's easy, it's usable, the overhead, the management of that is, is, is very low. But the other part we bolted on is the ability to ring fence. And that's saying, well, what can the application do? That's talking about the supply chain. What happens if the software that you chose to allow either can be weaponized against you, for mm -hmm. example, PowerShell, you can extract all your data with PowerShell without even running malware, uh, or Office can call PowerShell, or SolarWinds or Ryan can reach out to the internet and get instructions from anyone. So we recognize that even good software can either be used in a bad way or might have a vulnerability or a backdoor built into it. So we limit what the application can do. So when, because at some point, one of the applications you're running is going to get compromised. When it is compromised, it's essentially self-contained. So it can smash itself to pieces, but it can't get past its own application in your environment. How? How do you deal with the interoperability of the different applications and, and things that are doing syscalls or API calls against a single DLL where one may be allowed and one's not allowed? How are you, how are you handling kind of mm -hmm. the continuous evolution of that interoperability? So, and there's, so the app, the, first of all, is the DLL allowed to run? Because we think about DLLs, is this DLL allowed to run? And there's the shared DLLs, and we're able to know what all of the dependencies are, because we track it. I mean, we, we process billions of rows of data every single hour, uh, executables calling DLLs and scripts and everything else. So we know very, very quickly, hey, this is WinWord. This needs this, 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 this. We've, we have our labs environment that do nothing but learn that. But then also we have the tools to allow you to learn. So when you deploy a piece of software, and it says, I need to talk to all of these. Um, when you deploy it, you can put it into the Threat Locker testing environment. It deploys, it tests, or you put your machine in learning mode. It learns what it needs, and it creates that package on the fly. And then in addition to that, we can give, we have recommendations. So our team do nothing but look at what applications need outside of DLL. So it doesn't need access to your file system. 95% of the applications on your computer do not need to see your documents, do not need to see your, da your desktop, do not need to see your network shares. Yet by default in Windows, they, or even you can't even configure an exception to that. In Windows, all of them can see your data. Hmm. So we then say, well, we know that <clears throat> Zoom doesn't need to see your files. So by default, we're going to ring fence it so it can't see your files. And if you want to make exceptions, you can do that. And if you're not sure, if you need exceptions, you can put it in a monitoring state to see if any exceptions are needed. Yeah, I like the monitoring state because uh, in Linux, snap packages do some of that uh, kind of ring fencing that it can be problematic, right? You start it up and it goes, oh, I don't have access to the right file that, that I need. And in that environment, it, it's tricky because they're trying to have a profile that suits every single Linux user, right? And in your context, Danny, the customer can customize for their environment, right? Well, and that's it. We've got the, the, the packages, the pre-configurations that suit 99% of organizations. H however, there are always exceptions, and we generally go through an onboarding process, which is a learning followed by a simulation to make sure if there are problems before you lock down, we do a simulation and we make exceptions as needed. And I'm also thinking along the lines of what Tyler was saying too, um, is this is gonna help with process injection, right? We were talking about this with Jared Atkinson on our last, ep uh, one of our previous episodes, I should say, and you know, he was saying how there's millions of ways in which something can inject into another process, right? Millions of techniques. Um, and how do, you, how do you block all of them? I think your technology is a great application for this because you're gonna build a, a ring fence policy that says, well, no, it doesn't matter how you're injecting into another process, like you can disallow that pretty much on a global application scale, correct? Well, yes, you can say this can't talk to another application, but also, and it's it's funny because when you when you talk to people who are used to finding ways around EDRs, mm. they often they often give you scenarios that are only relevant to EDRs and aren't relevant to zero trust. So, for example, it's like, well, I had this program, and when I ran this program, it didn't do anything bad, but it injected into a Windows legitimate process, which meant that process could do this. Like, okay, so how did you run that program? So, well, I ran it, and it wasn't bad. It wasn't checked. I said, well, how are you going to run it on my machine? And they can't even get that far into the attack chain. But then even if they do, we're saying, hey, you can't talk to any other process. You can't connect, you can't sideload a DLL. You can't talk to, connect yourself to this because you're not allowed to talk to these other applications. But the, the big thing is, what people don't understand is when you can't start with that executable, 
you're now just limited to the Windows tools in or the tools that are allowed. And then the second thing is, well, even the tools that are allowed, like PowerShell does not need to see your network shares. Like we have a script on a rubber ducky, we plug it in and it exfills all the data. I sat there in Dublin and watched 15 people line up trying to get a free trip to Orlando, Florida if, they, if their EDR did not block my rubber ducky and 15 people in a row had their EDR extract data that allowed data to be extracted through mm-hmm. the rubber ducky, through PowerShell, because PowerShell was a trusted process, trusted tool built into Windows, no executable RAM. And so, and how does it differ in, in your uh, product, Danny? Well, so, so in the case of this, so the, in the case of the rubber ducky, there's no executable being ran in that case. But what is happening is PowerShell was being opened and PowerShell was saying, okay, I'm going to iterate through your documents and I'm going to upload them to the internet. Well, guess what? In 99% of cases, PowerShell doesn't need access to the internet. And if it does, it's probably to a set of IP addresses. Mm-hmm. Um, the, in, in 99% of cases, or more than 99% of cases, PowerShell doesn't need access to your documents, to your protected files, to your network shares. So yes, they could run PowerShell and they can do some pretty bad damage to your operating system with PowerShell. But they can't get your data, they can't encrypt your files, they can't upload it to the internet because it can't see your files, it can't get out to the internet. And you know, we've got that policy deployed, I think, I think you know, 46,000 customers, probably averaging three groups per customer, so there's easily 100 and something policies deployed with PowerShell not being able to see files, and that stops so many attacks. And you know how many exceptions I've made? Probably two in my life. So why do you, why do you think that this is not just being deployed to every place on the planet? Why are, you, why are you guys not acquired by Microsoft? Why is this hard for enterprises to hop on this bandwagon and, and believe that there's solutions out there for things like ransomware? I mean, that's a question I get, we'll call it more times than I care to admit a week on, well, how do we deal with ransomware? How do we deal with this new strand? How yeah. do we begin to get our return on investment from our security products okay. and all of the money that we're spending on you know, whatever blinky light box you want to call it this week? Why are we not just looking at doing this approach and leveraging companies like yourself that have this figured out and and deploy this for a quick win? So, and I think, by the way, they are. I mean, they are. Like going in since 2017 where we had zero customers to today where we have 46,000 businesses, companies are doing this now. Um, um, I, we are doing everything we can to educate and make people aware that this is why Threat Locker exists. This is what we do, and this is how we're going to help your business. And when we do meet companies, I mean, 30 something percent of companies that look at Threat Locker buy it within six months of looking at it the first time. Now, would I like it to be 100%? Yes. The others are longer sales processes, they're, they're harder to make decisions. Um, so companies are doing it. Why haven't we, we been acquired by Microsoft? Because I don't think I think if we sold Threat Locker today, it would end up being boxed in shelves as an unimportant product, and it wouldn't change the way the world works. Companies are trying to acquire us all the time. It, it, there's not a single week that doesn't go by where someone's trying to uh, send me emails interested in this. But my goal is to change it. So in you know, when we started Threat Locker, zero percent of small businesses uses whitelisting probably 0.001% of large businesses. Small businesses are increasing, large businesses are increasing. And my goal is that in 10 years time, more people are using technologies like whitelisting than are using EDR now. And I think if we sold Threat Locker, that would break that momentum. If, if, if someone had to buy Threat Locker, they'd have to really, really prove that they're gonna be able to change the way the whitelisting works. And they're not just gonna sit it on as a product on a checklist somewhere. That have to be. Hey, we want to change the way that the people think about endpoint security, and more and more companies are doing it. And I think in five years' time, maybe majority of companies are going to be whitelisting, and that, that is getting closer and closer and closer. I think we have about fifty. Uh, it's hard to measure this math, but for example, IT service providers (MSPs) about fifteen percent of those are now using Threat Locker in some way uh, or form, based on cost analysis we've done with other companies. So I think in five years' time, that is going to change. Is this is your pricing model and, and licensing, is this attainable by small businesses, large businesses, individuals, and, and consumers? Like, What is kind of the, the demographic and vertical that you're shooting for? Is it everybody? So we're, we're not into, so the, the challenge we're, so we're targeting businesses, but we're ta- uh, realistically we're targeting to IT professionals because someone has to make the decision, is this good or bad? And end users can't do that. So typically we, we have a lot of small business clients, but they go through MSPs and IT service providers. 
because they're managing the IT for them. We have a lot of mid-size and a lot of large businesses. The pricing is in line. Actually, it's probably cheaper than a traditional EDR, uh, but it's in line somewhere between antivirus and EDR pricing. So it's very attainable. It's very cheap. It's very easy to manage. And the, uh, you know what is our sweet spot? Literally, I've got everything from 100,000 endpoint deals down to small companies through MSPs with five endpoints. So it's very attainable for everybody. It, it's just a case of making sure everyone's aware of it. Danny, I wanted to just go back to the uh, ring fencing that you mentioned. The do you implement that in the kernel? Like, where's the the kind of the moment, of the the source of truth, I should say, for that protection? So it it is at the um, so it's a driver. So we run at the kernel level. We run okay. as a driver in Windows, and it, it, we, we're ring fencing is looking at different attributes. So it's looking at network traffic. It's looking at registry changes, file access, um, docu- uh, other application access. And we run it as a driver, so it's running in the kernel. The nice thing about it is when we looked at things like um, WannaCry, mm-hmm. it blocked them from being exploited. The, the bug's still there. We're not fixing the vulnerability. Right. It, but in most cases, <clears throat> we're, we're containing the blast radius to such an extent that it, it, you can't. It, it's very hard to do anything with that vulnerability. That's awesome. Um, supply chain threats. I, I've often said that we don't have great telemetry and technology to prevent things like the move it breach and solar winds, right? Because it's very much the opposite of where EDRs are, right? It's you get the software that's like it's good until it's not and it starts doing things that are that are different. I'd imagine that you're you're poised to really help with uh, the uh, supply chain threats that I think are going to continue in our industry. Yeah, and th- this is the thing. So, and there's there's really well, four types of supply chain uh, threats. There's one is the misuse of weaponized software. So we, we kind of deal with that. That's things like PowerShell. Someone's got a really powerful tool on your machine that can do really bad things, and you use it for another purpose, but it could be used if an attack gets onto your system. But someone getting into the supply chain, the, there's, there's three other attempts. There's, there's vulnerable software. So this is, hey, it's a bug. Mm. Most software companies are not security companies, which means most software developers aren't thinking about someone hacking their tool. They're thinking about, how do I push out software? Because I'm a software deployment tool. How do I uh, create accounting? How do I do finance? And all of these may have vulnerabilities into them. The other two areas are intentional backdoors, uh, which happens. I mean, we've seen this actually with security companies as well, where and it, or they may claim it's unintentional. A backdoor was built into their software to allow access. And this is where we start getting really concerned about nation state attacks, you know, uh, software that comes from Russia or China or other other countries that maybe aren't friendly to the West. Um, So we're concerned about intentional backdoors, but we're also concerned about uh, backdoors that were embedded. So in the case of SolarWinds, somebody got into SolarWinds source code, they implemented a backdoor, and then SolarWinds pushed that out unintentionally. So what can we do about that? When you deploy throughout Locker, the first thing we do is we tell you everything about the software that we know. So we have, again, our research team figure out everything, what country was it developed in? So if you're running something made in Russia, maybe you want to pay a little bit more attention to that software. Do I need it? What's the purpose of the software? And if I do need it, how can ring fencing help me with that? So we can limit. Okay, you're running, um, I'll use 7-Zip in the example. It's Russian software. Do we believe 7-Zip is bad? No. But can it be used to encrypt your files? Yes. Was it made uh, by a Russian? Yes. What can I do to mitigate my risk? I can ring fans. Learn, learn Russian. Russian. <laughs> Is that the right answer? <laughs> learn Russian, yeah. I can ring fence it. I can take away its access. And SolarWinds Orion, we effectively foiled that breach, not by detecting it, because nobody detected it, mm. but because Orion did not need to reach out to the internet. And by simply ring fencing it and stopping its internet access, we stopped it getting the instruction from the attacker. Yeah, I think a, a lot of where we're at too. I, I've seen that recently too on even things like Android. Like, yeah, this device has been uh, the victim of some kind of supply chain shenanigans, but you know, we cut out the C two or we restricted its access to the internet, so therefore it can't get the second stage payload or pose any threat, right? I mean, I do like to clean it up eventually, but you, you mitigated the threat. And and that's the point. We can't, we should always patch our systems. We should always make sure we've got um, firewalls in place and ports closed. But at some point, something bad is going to happen and you have to be prepared for that. And if you can mitigate the threat 
a, 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 it gives you temporary relief while you go off and patch the system and remove the, the vulnerability of the back door in the first place. Do you find any of the uh, folks that are, are using your technology do a, are better poised to reduce their attack surface and remove a lot of unwanted software? Because I feel like without this telemetry, you're not really doing that. And I also feel like with the, our endpoints are so bloated. Like I just configured uh, an Asus ROG Alley for one of my sons and like the amount of crap that was that, like comes with it, all the software on here. I'm like ripping out like tons of stuff. You know what my kids hate more than anything? Threat Locker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because they're, because they're, they're, their endpoints are pretty like that. Yes. Uh, the reality is remove the lower the tax surface by removing software. It, one of the things we offer companies, and this is one of the ways we convince people that Threat Locker is really important or, or whitelisting is important, ring fencing is important, is when you deploy Threat Locker, even as a free trial, you don't have to pay for Threat Locker. We'll go off and tell you information about the applications you're running. We'll tell you, hey, you're running Microsoft Office. This was made in these countries. You're running... Angry Birds, it was made here. You're running TeamViewer. These are the risks. You're running this software that was made in China. And every single customer that I do this for ultimately goes, oh, shit, on their call. They say, this right. is really bad. What's going on here? We need to fix this. And there's never an exception. I've never, And it could be something as, as simple as you're running this browser extension, and it can see all of your passwords and all of your web data, and it's made in China. And no, does it mean it's stealing it? No, but it can see it. And it, it helps companies. One is say, oh, these are risks I didn't know about. Browser extensions are one of the worst because people don't realize how much data they can see. Our own sales team uh, asked for a, a browser extension this week. Mm. And th it was going to help them. You, it used emails to make sure their, uh, sorry, AI to make sure their emails were properly worded. And it comes in as a request. Of course, it was denied because we're mean and we don't allow anything. But the first thing it says is, do you want to allow this AI extension that can see all of your web data and all of your passwords? Well, the answer is no. So when you see that, and when companies see that, they can, one is that IT people now have leverage to go to the business and say, this is our risk. Look what we've done by allowing users to self-manage. And secondly, um, it, it allows you to remove such a big security footprint because every single company ends up removing 60% of the software that was on their machines at the time of deploying ThreatLocker. 60%. Wow. Yeah. It, it, oh, it's terrifying. <clears throat> How deep do you dig into the browser, uh, Danny? Because that's a huge attack surface rate just in and of itself. Yeah. So, I mean, we're controlling the browser like any other application, but we're also controlling all extensions on the browser. So we control it with internet. We control it. We can see what the internet's doing. We can, we can control what it's doing. So is the browser hopping? So Internet Explorer in 2019, there was a vulnerability that allowed websites to launch PowerShell from your browser. Uh, we were able to foil that with ring fencing because we were limiting what it can do. But the browser extensions are the things that concern me the most because that's mm. what you just, and they don't even have to try and install it on their work machine. They sign in with their G Suite account and it pulls them all from the home machine. All those coupon clippers, all those mm -hmm. uh, dark mode extensions. That are, that can, and what we do is our research team actually go off and see exactly what these extensions can see. So when you get a request to say, hey, can you can I allow Cooper on my machine? Say, so, well, this can see your passwords and it can see your data. Do you really want to even allow it? And the nice thing about that, it's one of the features we're, we're adding this quarter, actually, is the ability for the user to know what they're requesting. So rather than it just going to the IT guy and the IT guy saying it can see this, this, and this, the user is now getting a message saying, do you want to request access to this browser extension that can see all your passwords? Hmm. And the user's self... In 80% of the time, the user is self-policing and saying no. The other 20%, we rely on the IT guy. <clears throat> Can you enforce policies within the browser to restrict access to the uh, what the plugins would have access to, Danny? Or is it just all-encompassing browser? So, unfortunately, the only person that can... So, we can enforce policies in the browser, like, can you save passwords? Can mm -hmm. you... Uh, do this in the uh, change settings. We can enforce what the browser can talk to. So if it is compromised, can it get onto your operating system? Can it see your files? Can it call that to PowerShell? And we can enforce what browser extensions are allowed to run. What we can't do is once you allow the browser extension, say what it can see. Because in Chrome, if the browser extension can't see what you give it access to, it doesn't function. Right. So what we're saying is we'll actually tell you, hey, this browser extension, if you allow it, it needs to see your passwords. Like a password manager obviously does need to see your passwords. But if you, so now you're giving the the user the information to make the decision. Mm. That's pretty awesome. And what other features you got coming on the horizon? 
Um, so the, the biggest things we've done, uh, the, the big one coming out at Zero Trust World, which we can't disclose, but um, I, to give you an idea of where we've been going, what we've realized in Threat Locker is more and more companies are using Threat Locker and eventually they're removing their EDR, they're removing their XDR because they're saying, okay, I'm, I'm not getting any alerts anymore for my EDR because Threat Locker, is, rather than trying to detect, is actually controlling. But insurance companies do require that. So what ThreatLocker did is we built, we released or announced ThreatLocker Ops last year. We released ThreatLocker Ops. And the idea with Ops is you can create policy-driven approaches to create alerts on certain bad behaviors or behaviors you don't want and automatically respond. So you may say this user has access to 200 files, but do they really, if they, or, or all of the files on the network system because of the CFO, but if they change more than 200, I want to shut them down automatically. And we've added the right. ops allows you to do that, but it also cross-references all of the behavior we collect from all of Threatlocker with known indicators of compromise. So for example, I tried to run Red Rabbit on my demo machine and it was blocked because PowerShell was ring fenced. But then Threatlocker Ops said, hey, you're trying to do something bad here. We're going to send this to your SOC and we're going to alert them about that. And we've just done a major upgrade to that where you can have lots of controls. It was released this week and we're going to continue to add some new exciting features around that, which will be announced at Zero Trust World in, on February, I think it's 24, no, uh, I can't remember. It's on a website anyway. <laughs> and the Zero Trust World, it's the end of February here in Orlando. So you still need to monitor your systems, but you're supplementing some of that monitoring as well. So what we're doing is we're allowing you, we're, we're providing the detection and response uh, alerting that you would typically get from your EDR with Threat Locker Ops. Um, so you can, you can continue to run your EDR alongside it, or you can say, okay, I'm getting my indicators of compromise on Threat Locker. Can we detect everything? No, and neither can your EDR. But what we can do is we can alert you of potential bad behaviors trying to happen while blocking them first. Is this um, just Windows based, or what? You, what does it look like when you start moving to other operating systems, Danny? Uh, Win, Windows, Mac, um, AIX actually is about to be released before Linux, because uh, uh, Linux is taking a little bit longer. Windows, Mac, and Linux will be is imminent. Uh, Mac is out now, but uh, who Linux still uses out. AIX? One of your uh, cust one of your customers, right? <laughs> we know how that goes. <laughs> it was a loaded you, question, Paul. Yeah, yes. I'm trying to. I'm, you, I'm, so, I'm throwing a softball. <laughs> You would be surprised how many companies use AIX. Um, and it's obviously not a, a very good business for us to AIX because the number of machines are in hundreds, not even thousands. However, it's a problem. It needs to be secured. And companies are looking for multi-platform, and that's what we're extending to do. So it's really about helping our, our Windows users with the, the, the systems that they still need to secure that they don't like the fact they have to use it. I would say probably... 10 to 15% of lot, big, big corporations that we sell to, I have got some kind of AIX deployment somewhere. All right, so uh, I'm going somewhere with this and 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 because I, I have to bring up a certain topic at some point, but I'm curious when most of our conversation has been about endpoints, we're not talking AIX devices in these few large corporations, it's endpoints. Um, can... can we understand what your what your technology is doing, but why do these companies need to have that type of protection in on service on on systems that presumably are pretty, you know, inside the the bowels of their networks? Okay, so we, we talk about endpoints, but what we consider an endpoint is any server or workstation. So, and SolarWinds Orion was a server attack, and that's where we defended from it. Exchange sure. vulnerability, which was absolutely horrific how bad that was. That exchange vulnerability allowed attackers to push ransomware to every device in your organization if your exchange server was publicly facing. Just by exploiting it, they could actually create a GPO, push out ransomware to everything in your organization just by exploiting your exchange server. That was foiled using ThreatLocker on exchange servers. So, we run ThreatLocker both on endpoints and servers which I know technically an endpoint is not a server, but it's normally the same operating system. Well, we used to call it the client-server relationship, and, and maybe that vernacular needs to come back. Um, my, and you're sort of you're setting up my next question rather easily. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I've been familiar in, in working with uh, whitelisting-type solutions for probably, f as long as they've been around, maybe 15 years-ish. Um, maybe a little bit less. Uh, my day job is PCI, so I work with companies that uh, are involved in the protection of 
credit card, debit card data. Uh, a lot of the large retail clients that I've worked with over the years struggled with endpoint protection when the endpoint, which we sort of intuitively think of as workstations and laptops and you know personal devices, but uh, don't often think about it as every cash register, every point of sale system, at every checkout lane, at all the large departments and small stores throughout the land. Um, I'm just curious, as an open-ended question, how much do you guys think about in play in uh, the PCI space in terms of protecting, you know, most specifically, I guess, point of sale systems? Yeah, we do a lot of point of sale systems. We do a lot of kiosks in airports. We do uh, bridgeways. We do ATM machines. Are, are very, very popular with Threat Locker as well. I say popular. They probably represent one percent of our endpoints because there's more desktops and servers out there. But it's we have a lot of that, and it's the nice thing about those is they're actually really easy to. Uh, protect because they don't change very much. So it's very easy to. Well, I was going to say that early on. It's a pretty static device, uh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully, it's uh, pretty easy to whitelist. When it's not. And, and, and then is it even um, production line systems, a lot of Windows XP, so uh, that you see on production lines that, that we thought we'd got rid of it, but now we're doing more of it again. <laughs> it seems to have come around for a second cycle of more XP deployments, but even production line systems are, are pretty common. They're roller coasters, all those types of devices that I can run on. Well, to clarify, and before a lot of people freak out like I just did, that Windows XP is still out there. Is it really Windows XP, or is it the in, the various embedded stripped down versions of Windows that are often used in these very special purpose devices that? for all intents and purposes, are built on Windows XP. So do you want to know the bad news? It's no. both. <laughs> it's both. No. Win, win, Windows XP in its, is, in its native state is still very much out there. And, 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 and it's I don't know if it's going to go anywhere in the next three or four years. Do we need a new T-shirt, Paul? We drink because you're still using Windows XP. Yeah. In your, in your OT. <laughs> In your OT. <laughs> well, oh I, and it's not necessarily always OT. Some of it is not OT, but it's a program that controls OT is quite often the case where yeah. they've got an HVAC system and the program, the desktop application that they used to run on their own desktop, uh, talks to the HVAC system and it won't it won't run on Windows 7 or it won't run on Windows 10 or 11 or, or anything newer. So that, that's quite often the case. It's not just the OT devices, but the programs that control the OT devices that used to run on their desktops and now have to run on a virtual desktop running Windows XP or something, or, or just have a separate machine. If you go to a factory floor, keyboard caked in dirt, and uh, there's a Windows XP machine sitting there. Are there, are there um, use cases that don't particularly work well for, for your software or, or deployments in which uh, you run into interesting challenges? So I don't know if it's so much as don't work well, but there are there are different configurations. So if you are a developer, um, quite often you're going to think about, well, can I actually whitelist everything? How do I want to approach that? And some developers, like if you look at Threat Locker, we take a really strict approach to whitelisting on developers. We allow exactly what they need. They can recompile those programs over again. Uh, but only on that file name, only if it's created by Visual Studio. Whereas other companies say, well, that's too challenging for us because we write lots of different pieces of software. We often add new controls. So they'll approach to more of a, hey, I'm going to ring fence by default, and I'm going to say, you can run whatever you want, but if it's not on the trusted list, it can't talk to our network. Hey, I had one more sort of quasi-PCI-related question. You were talking about uh, browser security a little little while ago. Do you uh, deal much with the uh, protection of um, uh, you know, the client scripts that are loaded in client browsers? Uh, and, you know, and or are you familiar with uh, the type of attack that's commonly referred to as a mage card attack? I, I'm not familiar with that type of attack, and maybe I, I am, but I'm not not in that reference. So, so mm -hmm. scripts, can, client scripts, obviously have to run. JavaScript runs in browsers. It runs on nearly every website you go to in some shape or form. So, obviously, you can't mm -hmm. block JavaScript from running. But what we can do, and what we do see quite often, is when the JavaScript tries to exploit either a vulnerability or a feature in Windows, for example, it might. I mean, the most basic is, hey, it's just going to auto download a file, and then someone's going to run the executable. 
or mm -hmm. it's going to, it's going to uh, try and open a program. So when you go to zoom.com, it automatically opens Zoom. If Zoom's not allowed, that's not allowed to run. But if something tries to automatically open PowerShell or something tries to hop from Chrome to PowerShell or register or run DLL, they're the things that we're, we're very, very concerned about. And we make sure that we limit what those browsers can talk to. Because the, the risk of a browser is two things. One is that, um, the extension inside the browser can see data in the browser. So the browser itself, has very sensitive data in it, and we need to protect that, making sure we limit the extensions. The other thing is that the browser can actually get outside of the browser. It can call another program, and that program could potentially become an entry point into your network. Okay. Well, I mean, very briefly, uh, a mage card attack is sort of what we refer to as an electronic yeah. skimming attack, where uh, because the the scripts that are served to clients are often not looked at or protected or, or thought about, uh, they can be intercepted, modified, and nobody knows the difference. So basically, attackers will insert themselves in an e-commerce system, corrupt the script. So you, the consumer, think you're shopping it wherever, acme.com, buying a widget, and you enter in your payment card information, and it gets sent through, and you, you're you ordering the widget, the, the data ultimately goes to the acme.com, but the hacker's sitting in the middle intercepting it, kind of like a man in the middle, because he's he's introduced a script that's his script that's, that's, that's harvesting all the data. So there's new requirements coming in PCI in the next couple of months with version four that starts focusing on the protection of client-side scripts that are being loaded into the client browsers, but you know, protecting them where they're stored on, on the web server itself and, and making sure that they're, they're you know, valid and authorized, something like I think that you guys could kind of cover in a whitelisting type of sense, you know, checking the validity, making sure that they haven't been altered, modified, that type of thing. Does that so, make so more sense? And is that more in your bailiwick? Yeah. So I, th I think that there's, so there's two ways these attackers are getting the script. One is they're putting it on the server. Uh, which mm -hmm. it obviously allows to a vulnerable server or a vulnerable dev process. And that's obviously a lot harder to deal with because technically if they're uh, now what happens is when the client runs the web page, they're also loading the, the script. So, and quite often yep. we see this a lot with WordPress sites where, uh, and, and unfortunately protecting the client is hard on this, where you are hosting a WordPress site and you've gone and subscribed to some free service to make your site uh, better maybe give you a pop-up in the bottom right corner or, or make a menu structure or something like that. And then you go and add e-commerce to your site. And then whenever you collect that credit card number, um, you, all of that JavaScript is running on the site because it's loaded in the client's browser. And obviously for us, that's really hard to deal with because we, the, it's running, it, it's coming from the client. Now, if it's a known bad script, you can detect on that. Uh, right. The other area is where the script is being, well, and I suppose there's a man, there's, there's something in the middle. The problem is with the middle on an HTTPS, the only way you can do it is through a proxy. Uh, so you can have like a, an SSL decryption firewall in your network. But if we'd, we're talking about outside of that, where the IT team is being compromised, um, the, the end user then has some kind of script running in their browser that they have managed to run either through an add-on, is through an extension of some sort or through software on their machine, uh, through a vulnerable browser potentially. Uh, and that's where we're going to help because we're going to stop those add-ins and things coming in. But we're, I don't think we can do anything from the server side because that's that's up to the vendor. And the, the vendors really need to be very, very careful about what they add in those cases because they're being held accountable. Now, where it gets challenging is when it has a vulnerability and it pushes something. And that's where we can help with the service protected with Threat Locker. But I, I see a lot of this on the PCI side is really the WordPress side because there's so many add-ins in WordPress and again, back to that point, marketing developers aren't security people and marketing people are definitely not security people. So when they go and build a website, they can just add whatever extension they want without understanding the consequences. You say that and, and yet they drive the messaging for so many vendors and, and you know, marketing campaigns because become our industry buzzwords more, uh, more often than not. We're here talking about zero trust, which used to be called something different. <laughs> so, exactly. uh, but it's uh, I, I'm I'm very aware of it. And if, if you look at threat locker messaging back in 2017, the word zero trust wasn't used. But mm -hmm. hey, it, unfortunately, the industry the 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 cloud used to be called hosting, and now it's called the cloud. So it's uh, it, the marketing people control the security world, but they don't necessarily they're not security people. And yep. it, we we always have that. Um, 
you know, controls ourselves. Our marketing said, we want to do this, we want to do this, we want to do this. And we were like, no, 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 that's not going on our website. And <laughs> it was, a, it, it, it was a hard sell for, for well, I say sell, it was a hard dictation for me to say no so many times to the marketing department because they want all these cool tools, these scripts, these add-ons. And we often say, no, 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 no. The, the less is more. Dana, I just wanted to dig in briefly into, uh, you said you create profiles, your team creates profiles for things like Windows applications. How does that process work? What does that profile look like? Is that really just a, the profile is describing what that software should do in a known good state? Yeah, so and that's pretty much it. So, and we focus on the most weaponizable tools. But uh, so, for example, though, we'll use Zoom as an example. Mm. What does Zoom need to do in its day to day functions? It needs access to your camera, it needs access to your microphone. Um, and obviously, if it was compromised, it could gain access to those, which is a problem. Right. But that, that's what it needs. Uh, but it doesn't need access to PowerShell. It doesn't need access to RedServe, run DLLC script. It doesn't need access to your network shares. Uh, it doesn't need to go out to the internet except to zoom.com or zoom.us or whatever the names are. So what our team will do is they'll create a profile around that. They'll say, this is what this program needs. So when you permit it, mm -hmm. it will recommend you should only use it in this environment. The same applies to PowerShell, RedServe. I mean, RedServe has the ability to run code directly from GitHub. Now, that's a big risk in your environment. But I've never in my life seen a good reason for RedServe to reach out to the internet. So right. just by saying, hey, we're going to limit, this is what this needs to do in a normal environment. Are there exceptions? Of course. How often do they come up? 0.1% of the time. So, And we find them in simulation. So that's really what we're doing. We're saying, this is what this needs. We don't care about what bad behavior is. We care about what good behavior is. And everything else, therefore, is irrelevant and should be blocked. This gets more difficult when you start diversifying into other operating systems like Linux, right? Because the applications could be, could be different depending on the distribution, could be tuned differently. You know, you got 12 distributions. They all deploy a, let's say, Zoom package, right? But it's, it's tuned differently. I guess some of the base behaviors may not change, but other applications, it, it could. I'm just curious your thoughts on how to profile uh, applications on things like Linux. Uh, and most Linux operating systems run on a different pretense. They're, they're really doing what Windows should have been doing to begin with. And Microsoft's success is primarily driven, and the same with Apple's success, is prim primarily driven on the basis of being able to do whatever you want, which means it's very easy to make a computer work. The reason Linux is not a successful desktop operating system is because it's very hard to make things work because out of the box, you actually have to allow, and, and look, there are exceptions, distos are all different, you have to allow by exception. Um, and they're not making it easy for you at all. So uh, it, it is a problem when you go into Linux that, that you've got different applications. But one of the nice things is as, as we create these profiles, we define what we think, and then we put them in a simulation mode, and then we change our thoughts based on what we know, and hey, mm. this actually needs this. And we can adjust and, and uh, as we need be. Yeah. I, don't I think don't worry, Paul. I, it's the year of the Linux desktop still. Well, I think from a... <laughs> uh, if you're talking Chromebooks, perhaps, but I think that, you know, giving Linux users that uh, flexibility and control over the applications that largely we acquire from third parties that we may or may not trust. I mean, we, we want to trust them, but someone packaged up that application for that specific distribution. Is it stealing my passwords and in, in my browsing data or is it acting like an application that it should? I want to know the difference. So I think this technology, as applied to these Linux-based, uh, you know, not just desk, you know, desktops, but servers as well, Danny, I think is really uh, in interesting, and I think um, something that people want for sure, uh, or oh, should I, want, right, on Linux, yeah. because you shouldn't trust the supply chain. Absolutely, I think that's the, the supply chain. The software you put on your machine is your biggest risk. Mm. of any computer and the, the, creating the least amount of privilege as is the most important thing to do actually we did a, a, a webinar a few weeks ago and then this is an example of why weak privilege can be really bad so in windows when you pair a bluetooth device it asks you to validate the pin number on both sides in mac when you pair your airpods for example you don't validate anything. You open your AirPods, you say, add an AirPod, and it says, oh, this is, we found your AirPod, is this it? And you say, yes. Yeah, those are um, those uh, Bluetooth low energy things that we can spoof using a Flipper Zero. And if you, it, two weeks ago, no, probably two months, I'm not sure, a few weeks ago, if you look on our, webin our, web our YouTube channel, you'll see it, there's a webinar, and it's, it's called Hardening Windows, Hardening Macs. And 
I had I had been given a challenge in that my VP of product is a, an Apple whore, so he loves Apple <laughs> products. And and he when we tried the rubber ducky on the Mac a few weeks before, the Mac asked me to configure the keyboard, so it kind of failed. I couldn't just plug in the rubber right. ducky. So we went out and first of all we made the rubber ducky work on the Mac, and all we had to do was change the serial number, so it thought it was a US keyboard. Apple. So that fixed the rubber but I wanted to do more. So what we did is we used the flipper zero mm -hmm. uh, and it's a really good webinar if you get time to watch it or, or it's on YouTube. Uh, we used the flipper zero to intercept his connection between his Bluetooth headset and his Mac computer. And then we injected keystrokes through the headset, gained a full reverse shell onto his Mac. I've seen um, that research presented. I haven't seen anyone with a tutorial on like exactly how to do it. But now that you say that I did see where someone discovered that flaw it hadn't released all the detail, unless they have since the last time I looked at it. But we did cover that, which is really scary, uh, actually. It's And Apple's response is, this is how it's designed to work. Right. Um, so and we, it, so if you get it, that hardening Mac, it's absolutely terrifying how easy it was. So we, Because he, he was like, hey, you can't get a rubber ducky working on my Mac. Not only did we get the rubber ducky working, but we actually managed to do it without even plugging something into the Mac from 200 feet away using a flip out with an extended, uh, and I can't remember what it was, but it was an extended antenna on the top of it um, to actually get further boost. And what we learned is if you use two flippers, it's better than one. Oh, yeah, because you've got, a, is it a race condition to get the messages to the device? I, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure. And look, I, I, I took the credit in that I made Rob admit that Macs were better. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what I did is I, I don't like losing, so I, I, I positioned half of our ops team onto making uh, into figuring out how to destroy Rob's Mac. So, <laughs> Sounds a little Kobe Asi yeah. Maroon. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So, uh, but but, it, but it, it's it's interesting. Like that, that's the difference between convenience. Is the pin a pain in the ass? How much of a pain in the ass is that pin? Right. Apparently, it's a it's it's not a pain in the ass. You should just put it in there on the map because. You, by not having it, we were able to very, very easily not just gain audio control, but gain keyboard control to mm -hmm. the Mac device by pretend, by intercepting the connection between his Apple headset and his Mac computer. That's awesome. Yeah, I've seen that research. Like I said, I haven't seen the, like, uh, the full write-up in, in details yet, but I have seen that research. where yeah. All I, I heard in, was like, more flippers, more better. All right. Well, you don't. Uh, flip, uh, you, you can use a flip, like anything else. You can use a flipper for some things, or you could use other devices as well, right? That's. Yeah, I, I have I have two hundred flippers in a box back there for Zero Trust World, uh, so I've, I've got plenty of flippers. <laughs> so, nice. There you go. Uh, so, you use what you uh, have, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so because uh, because we're going to do some labs on uh, flippers at Zero Trust World, which is always fun. It's awesome. awesome. Well, great. Um, well, obviously, folks can. Uh, I didn't know about Zero Trust World. Uh, when is that happening? I, I, you know, I should know the date as it's the biggest countdown in our office right now. But let me just look at, if you don't mind. Um, it is. Um, I didn't know there was a Zero Trust World. Yeah. So, it, oh, there it is on the front page. It's on. Our, it's on. Our, it's February twenty six to twenty eight. Clearly, in Orlando. not trusted, Paul. That's right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a, but it's basically three days of how to use a rubber ducky, how to use Metasploit, how to use a flipper, and how to defend against this stuff. Because the, the goal isn't just to tell you that the world's a bad place, but to, to show you tips and tricks for defending. Uh, it's three days of labs, and it, it's, a, it's good fun. It's in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we host it every year, February 26th to 28th. And I think, you know, we, we got some cool speakers coming in. We get some... Oh, some... so this is... Oh, I see. So this is your conference, and it's not just a dog and pony show. Like, you're actually training people how to do cool stuff. Oh yeah, it is. It is really, really hands-on because there's nothing I hate more. So th there's there's a few parts to it. There's a, how to use Threat Locker. So we have our university, our labs, and if you pass our test, which seventy percent of people do not, um, you actually get a refund of your ticket. Um, the Cyber Hero test. Um, the um, we have three day. Uh, we have Rubber Ducky Labs. We have Pineapple Labs. Uh, that was a disaster last year. We actually flew a pineapple in on a drone and it didn't go so well. <laughs> so uh, um, we have uh, Metasploit Labs, Capture the Flag, things like that. But it's it's hands-on. So we, you, we have hundreds of laptops set up at labs and you, you register for labs, you go in. And then we have some cool speakers come in. Last year, we had Captain Sully Sullyberger. This year, I think we got Mark Rober, the, the NASA engineer that's a big YouTuber for the data bombs. So, but it's it's not just that, hey, look at our PowerPoint, look at the trend. We don't like PowerPoint. 
That's awesome. really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, Danny, thank you so much for appearing on <clears throat> Paul Security Weekly. Uh, Paul, thank you for having me, and thank you guys. I appreciate it. With that, uh, that will, I believe, conclude the show or go on to the next segment. I'm not sure which because this is pre-recorded, but thanks everyone for listening and watching.